The baptism of Jesus has been a source of debate among Christians since, well, since Jesus was baptized, I suppose. But the account we read in Matthew 3 has a lot to teach us. Last week, as I said, we, we were introduced to John the Baptist, and he had been chosen by God before he was born to be, to be a herald or the forerunner of the Messiah. His job was to prepare the way for the one who was coming that all history had waited for. He had an important job, and he took it very seriously. John was telling people that the Messiah, God's promised Savior, was, was coming soon and that the people needed to repent and, of their sins and turn back to God. And as people did just that, John would baptize them in the Jordan River. And we don't know how many people that John baptized or how long he had been doing it, but we know that he created quite a stir and he had attracted a lot of followers and he attracted a lot of people who would become his enemies. And one day, what he was saying was going to happen actually happened. It was the day that Jesus came to be baptized. And, and we read, as Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me, he said. But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. This is an important event in the ministry of Jesus. It was so important that it's one of the events that all four Gospels include. Matthew's account gives us the most information about what happened, but all four Gospel writers felt that it was important enough that it needed to be included in, in their writings. Though we can understand why this was a significant event, we may also find ourselves asking why it was necessary. This is one of those accounts that's difficult for us to understand. Why would Jesus need to be baptized. John was calling people to come and repent of their sins and, and then he baptized them. Well, Jesus was sinless. He had no sins which to repent. He, it seems strange that he would have wanted to come and be baptized by John and, and if we're confused about it, we're not alone because John was also confused about it. We learn from the Gospel of John written by another John, not John the Baptist, but we learn from the Gospel of John that this, at this point, John the Baptist didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. But it still seems clear that he knew Jesus, and he knew he was someone special. Uh, when Jesus came and told him he wanted to be baptized, John resisted. He declared that, that Jesus should be the one baptizing him, not the other way around. But Jesus says it's okay. He told him it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. And that was enough for John, and he went ahead and baptized Jesus. But from our perspective, that still leaves some questions. Why was it that God would require Jesus to be baptized? And scholars have debated this for centuries and have wrestled with, with why it was appropriate, why it was necessary for Christ to be baptized, and and uh, I'll first start out talking about some, about some of the arguments that have no merit, in, in my mind anyway. Some people have said that Jesus needed to be baptized, needed to be baptized, because up to this point, Jesus was just a man. But the baptism, after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came into him and he became God. This is simply not true. It's false teaching. Jesus had always been God. Jesus was part of the Trinity when creation took place. So, baptism was not just an item on Jesus' list that he must do before he could become fully God. It was not something that had to be done to complete his godness. Others have said that Jesus was providing an example for us, showing us that we need to be baptized in order to be right with God as well. And... There is an element of truth to this because Christians are baptized as a way of identifying with Christ and declaring our faith in Him. But John's baptism was different than Christian baptism. In the book of Acts, 
We read about some people who had been baptized by John, but were later rebaptized with Christian baptism. John's baptism was one of repentance, but Christian baptism recognizes and symbolizes the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. It symbolizes how Jesus paid our sin debt once and for all, and how we are made clean through His blood. So, so while Jesus may have been foreshadowing how Christians should be baptized, He was not merely giving us an example to follow. Still others say that Jesus was showing us that baptism was necessary to be accepted by God. Baptism has no power to make us right with God. It is Jesus that has the power to make us right with God. Jesus did tell us that Christians should be baptized over in Matthew 28, but, but baptism is a symbol of the salvation we receive. Baptism is not the cause of the salvation we receive. So we're still left to ask, why was it necessary for Jesus to be baptized? And, and I'm going to give you my honest answer. I don't know. I don't fully know. Many Christian scholars throughout history have put forth reasons to why, why Jesus' baptism was necessary. Uh, one view says that Jesus was being baptized because he was acting as a substitute for us. He was not being baptized for his sins, but he was symbolically being baptized for ours. Another view is that he was baptized as a way of identifying with us. He was demonstrating his humanity, showing that he was like us. And so he submitted to baptism in much the same way that, that we do. Another view says he was helping to fulfill the prophecy about Elijah from, from Malachi. By submitting to John's baptism, he was showing that John the Baptist was the one who was preparing the way for the Lord. And yet another view says he was using this as a sign of the beginning of his earthly ministry and an opportunity for God to give evidence that he was the Messiah. I think each of those have some merit. Each of them seems like a valid explanation of why Jesus needed to submit to, to baptism by John. One of them may be the reason that Jesus needed to be baptized, but also it's impossible that the reason is, is something entirely different. Ultimately, we don't know. John didn't know either. Based on the text, it seems like Jesus didn't give him a lengthy theological explanation. He just was simply told that God wanted it to happen, and that was enough for John. And that right there is a lesson for us, folks. We are supposed to be obedient to God even if we don't understand. Even if we don't have the answer to the questions of why that we have, we're still called to be obedient. If we trust the Lord, then we will do what the Lord calls us to without demanding an explanation. And we, we see this in children all the time. Every kid that I know somewhere uh, uh, around three to four years old, they go through the why, the why phase, right? They ask you why. And it is exhausting to talk to one of those children in that phase. Uh, why is the sky blue? Well, you can go into the scientific because light refracts and all. And then they're going to follow that up with why. Okay? And then no matter what you say, they're going to follow it up with why until eventually you give the answer that always made you mad when you were a kid. Because I said so. That's why. We don't like that answer, but that is a valid answer. Sometimes it may be as if God is saying to us, because I said so. That's why. Children don't always have the capacity to understand the reasons why we as adults do the things that we do. Sometimes the issues involved are simply too complex for their little minds to comprehend. So it's pointless for us to try to explain them. Sometimes the need for obedience is urgent. There's simply not time to explain it all right now. The explanation will come later, maybe. 
Regardless, we expect obedience from our children because we expect them to know that, that we really do love them and we really do want what's best for them and we really do tell them what they need to do for their better being. That's similar to our relationship with God. Sometimes God does explain all the answers to the questions why I've life. Sometimes I think it's because the answer will come later. Sometimes it's because I think I'm too dim to understand. And sometimes I think maybe he is simply wanting me to just trust him. And therefore an answer is not needed. Regardless of the reason, our job is simply to obey. Even if we don't understand the reason why. That's what Jesus did. That's what John the Baptist did as well. And we should follow their examples. Now after the baptism... Jesus came up out of the water. There's another significant event. It says, after his baptism, he came up out of the water. The heavens were opened in that he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. This event was significant for a couple of reasons. First, it identified Jesus as the Messiah, the one that God had promised, the one who would come to redeem His people. John the Baptist was looking for this specific sign to know that the Messiah had come. We read his account in John chapter 1. He says, I, I did not recognize Him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that He might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. I did not know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. John knew that Jesus was someone special. He may have even been pretty sure that Jesus was the Messiah. I, I think He is. But when He came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended upon Him, He knew. God had told Him that was the sign. He knew. Second, we get a glimpse of the Trinity here. The Trinity is... It's a very difficult doctrine to understand. It's one of those things that sounds simple on the surface, but the more you think about it, the more mind-boggling it is. This doctrine says that there is one God, but this one God exists, always has existed, always will exist in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there have been all kinds of analogies throughout my education that have been put forth to try and explain the Trinity. Uh, I've heard it uh, relayed to as a triangle, as uh, uh, you know, the elements of water. You know, water is one element, but it can exist in three different states. They don't come close to what the Trinity really means. There really is not an analogy to explain this any better. God is unique. But it's a truth that's clearly taught to us in Scripture. And, and many people have concluded that Christianity is untrue because they simply can't wrap their minds around the doctrine of the Trinity. But it seems to me that if we only believe in things that we can prove, if we only believe in things that we understand completely, then we're not walking in faith, right? Just because we can't prove something, just because I don't understand something does not mean that it is not true. Regardless, in this account we see all three members of the Godhead at once. The Father speaks and declares that Jesus is the Son and He is pleased with Him. And then we see the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, come down and settling on Jesus like a dove. Now whether that means that an actual dove descended from heaven... Or the way the Spirit appeared reminded people of a dove. We don't know, but we see the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, making an appearance here as well. This passage is one of the clearest examples that we see of the absolute and perfect unity of the Trinity. 
And it gives us a glimpse of who God is. I find it interesting that the first time that we see the three persons of the Trinity is in the account of creation. And now we see the Trinity again at the start of Jesus' earthly ministry. It seems fitting that we see the Trinity when the world was created and again when God's plan is coming to fruition. God created the world and now God is redeeming the world. It's no wonder that all four writers of the gospel saw this as significant because clearly God meant it to be. Now the accounts of Jesus' baptism that we read in the gospels are incredible. They are even more so when we understand what's really happening. Here was God the Son. Just as much a part in creation as the Father and the Holy Spirit. But here was God the Son who put the world into motion through creation, entering into the world, subjecting himself to life as a human being. And here we see the love of God on display, and he begins to show us how he is going to take our sin and pay the penalty that we cannot. These verses serve as the opening lines of God's story of redemption. There's a lot going on in this, these verses that, we, that we've, we really don't understand fully, but that shouldn't deter us, and we shouldn't let it keep us from missing the lessons that we can learn. So let's, let's end our time here with, with, with just some lessons about this. First, these verses teach us about the nature of baptism. Now John's baptism was different than Christian baptism. It reminds us that, that Jesus said that all Christians should be baptized. So if you are a follower of Christ and you have not been baptized, baptized you, you need to make plans for that to take place in your life. It's not necessary for salvation. Baptism isn't what saves us. Jesus is what saves us. But it is a way of identifying ourselves with Christ. It's a public declaration of our devotion to the Lord. In our country, that doesn't require much sacrifice on our part. I mean, you might be uncomfortable to come to the front of the church in front of a few people and, and be baptized. Maybe your family wouldn't understand if they're not followers why it's important to you. But for most people in our country, there are a few negative consequences of following the Lord and being baptized. In other countries, however, as Nancy spoke earlier, that's an entirely different matter. Declaring your allegiance and faith in Jesus might get you disowned from your family, might make you lose your job, might make you a target of those who seek to take your life away from you. Still, Jesus said that Christians should be baptized. It's an important step of commitment and identifying ourselves with Christ. It serves as a reminder of, of where we find our identity, of what we believe. This passage reminds us that though baptism is a symbol, it's an outward sign of the inward working of God's grace in our life, but it's still very, very important. Second, these verses teach us a lesson on obedience. If we learn nothing else from these verses, we should learn that God has a plan so much bigger than what we can fathom. God has planned this moment that we read in this passage from before he even created the world. He had a plan in place to save us from our sin. And, and this was from the very beginning. We cannot possibly understand everything that God is doing. But there are some things that we can clearly understand. We can understand what he tells us to do. Even if we don't understand why he tells us to do them. So this passage should remind us to follow God's instructions in our living. Even when God's instructions run contrary to what I think is best for my life. Even when God's instruction is opposite of what the world says we ought to do. If we really trust the Lord, if we really live in faith, if we are really in Christ, then we will do what God says. And lastly, we should learn that God's plan is fulfilled in Christ and in Christ alone. 
I find it interesting that John's message attracted such large crowds. And that lets us know that people crave forgiveness. I mean, we know we need help. Even people who think that they are good folks or try to explain their sin and reason in a way they, they know that deep down they long to be forgiven. The baptism of Jesus should remind us that we can have forgiveness through Him. It's because of His sinless life that our sin can be paid for and forgiven. Jesus came for the express purpose of dying on our behalf, taking our sin, making it possible for us to be forgiven. When we begin to understand this truth, it should blow our minds away, folks. But it's not enough for us simply to be amazed and blown away at God's love and His plan. We have to respond to that by following Jesus. This means that, that we can't rely on our own goodness to please God. We have to recognize that no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we do, we can never be good enough to atone for the sins that we have committed. The only way for us to be forgiven and to spend eternity in heaven is to return and follow Christ. Christ is unique and He is the only way that you and I can be forgiven. So how do you view Jesus? Nancy was talking about all the folks at the inaugural uh, celebrations praying and ending in Jesus' name. Shortly after 9-11 took place in Burke County, I was invited to a, to a county and statewide uh, government worship service, this is how I would describe it. And it was a service that was held at the Broughton uh, Chapel at the State Mental Hospital, <laughs> a fitting place for government work to take place. Uh, but... Uh, it was interfaith, and there was, uh, there was a rabbi, there was a Muslim fellow, a Buddhist fellow, and then there was this elderly black minister who was from a Pentecostal denomination. And he was the last to pray. And, uh, and the Muslims got up, and the Buddhists got up, and uh, there, was, uh, there was a Mormon, I think, and there was some other folks. And, and he got up, and he just kind of scratched his head. And he said, uh, well, it's nice if y'all would come. He said, but uh, now we're going to pray to the one God who has control over everything. And uh, it, it kind of blew my mind that he went there, but... Uh, as Nancy said, we have to stand up, not be ashamed of our Savior. And he led the most beautiful prayer, and some of the folks got up and walked out and left. But we worship the true God. So how do you view Jesus? Some view him as just another religious leader, a person who has made a lot of empty promises. These people clearly haven't looked into who Jesus really is. They haven't examined the evidence that proves that Jesus rose from the dead. Some think Jesus is just one of many religious options, all of which are basically the same. Still others view Jesus as a great person, one of the best men who ever lived. They see him as a great teacher with a lot of good advice. Well, this passage helps us to see that Jesus is much more than any of these. Jesus is God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. Not just someone whose advice we should follow. He is the one, the only way to God the Father, the only way to heaven. So be honest with yourself. Is that who Jesus is to you? Do you follow Jesus wholeheartedly as your Savior? Or, you just, or do you simply look to Him as a, as a good man, a great moral teacher? Do you admire Jesus or do you follow Jesus? And I want to remind you that you can sit in church every Sunday of your life and never really know who Jesus is. Do 
Do you follow Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus? There are a lot of things in life that I do not understand, but there's one thing that is clear to me above all things. Jesus came to die for me. I don't understand why He loves me that much. I don't need to know why He loves me that much. I just celebrate and enjoy the fact that He did and that He does and that He died for me. And He died for you. And because of that fact, and I live in that, I stake my life on that, He is my Lord, He is my Savior, that I will live with Him for all eternity. So we learned the lesson in Jesus' baptism. We don't have to know why. God said it had to be done, so it was done. And we're going to move on from that next week. But I want you to spend some time this week just thinking about who Jesus is to you. Is He your Savior? Is He your Messiah? Is He real? Is your relationship with Him personal? If it is, good for you. If it's not, you need to make some changes. May the Holy Spirit work in your life to convince you, to convict you, to push you, to pull you, do whatever it takes to move you to the point where you realize that Jesus is more than a person in a book. He is the most important person. More important than your mom, your dad, your grandparents. More important than the President of the United States. More important than your wife or your husband or your children. He is to be your all in all. First and foremost. Forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.